Hello and welcome everybody to Sonic Talk episode number ooh, 482. Yes, we're gradually winding our way to 500. 500 of what, you might be asking? Well, Sonic Talk is uh, music technology, production, live production, electronic music, synthesizers, software, DJ, controllerism, anything to do with that kind of stuff or sort of all the ancillary subjects that surround the music business, uh, of which I think there still is one just about. That's what we talk about here. Yeah, so I want to say welcome to you all for joining us. I want to say also thank you uh, for hanging with us. I think we've got sort of a web chat working, but it seems like it might not be working all that well. We'll fix that for next week, but it's at least working to a degree. If not, and you still want to get some chat, get head over to our sonicstate.com slash live and you should have a link to the uh, our live stream on youtube where there's also a chat room and you can join in there if you're if you're having feeling a bit left out or there should be instructions on how to use an irc client whatever that is with your with the chat room so thank you very much for I joining just, sorry mark yes i just posted a url in the chat room which i took from your i looked at your page source Ah, okay. So your height is set to 300 pixels, but I just posted the URL. If you click on okay. that URL, you'll get the thing full there screen. There we go. I'm posting that in, uh, I think I'm posting that in YouTube as well. Thanks for that, Mark. Um, before we get to our guest, I should quickly say hello uh, and thank you to our sponsors, Isotope, who will be giving away a copy of Neutron, their mixing tool, uh, which we talked a bit, little bit about last week. It was sort of rather uh, spontaneous praise for it, which was great if a little embarrassing being that they're a sponsor of the show it was in no way fixed it's just that it's that good right so if you want to win one stick around and uh, that will be coming up about halfway through the show so let's now get to our guests as you heard from uh, mr mark tinley who has amongst many things now got the correct lower third to his profession uh, sonas magus which is or magus which is a uh, music shop uh, of curiosities oddities and diy and uh, custom made instruments electronica and all of that sort of thing in glastonbury how are you mark i'm all right and that's brilliant because now i can stop going on about it <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> oh, yes, um, I suppose so. Uh, well, that's fair enough. We did do a no, deal. I, so I, I, just I, feel, th- <laughs> I feel a little bit like everything I talk about seems to revolve around that. So I'm just, I'll, I'll make a conscious effort not to bring it up a million times during the podcast. Um, that's fair enough. I think that's a fair deal. I think I'll stick with that. But thank you, Mark. Mark, as well as being the proprietor of said music shop, Mark has a history and background in uh, music production live production sound design all of those things around it would that be fair to say yes i awesome. think that would be fair to say i'm very old and i've done lots of things let's, let's... <laughs> <laughs> and all of them are legal and above board i might add of, right oh of course yeah <laughs> right uh, so let's get on to uh, guest number two mr gaz williams who's there in bristol where uh, i think that's in his production room where he does mastering record producing mixing recording and is also uh, a keen music technologist, as you'll probably see him on a few of our episodes of Sonic... Uh, what's it called? Sonic Lab, that's right. Stuff where we review <laughs> things. Gosh, I'll, nearly get, I'll get there in the end. <laughs> yeah, and a bassist. Oh, yes, of course, I forgot that. A bassist. <laughs> see, I can't see your bass tree behind you. I can only see like a, micro, no, a, a headphone tree. There we go. There's a bass. <laughs> Gaz Williams uh, uh, was over with us yesterday uh, uh, looking at, as I said earlier, uh, Cubase 9. So we'll have that coming up quite soon. Yeah. No. Yeah, it's good. It's good Excellent fun. fun. Excellent fun. Well, I'm just turning around to make sure everything's working because it was a bit of a hurried thing. Sometimes, because what I have to do is the Facebook, like, this is dull. I'll, I'll say it once and I'll probably say it every week, even though I say I don't say it again. Um, because I do use Facebook Live, I have it ha- happening at a specific time because if I don't, then you end up with all of this preamble because I can put the preamble on uh, YouTube, but I would rather keep it sort of tight without all the waffling before and after. So that's why uh, I, I try and get it bang on 403, I think we were today. So I'm hoping those Facebook users can see all of that. So what a week. Have we got some news this week? Because as we know, it's been a little bit quiet because obviously people have really focused on NAM, uh, although we have in fact got... Uh, First up, Music Messer coming up at the beginning of April. I think it's the 5th to the 8th of April. And then uh, Superbooth in Berlin, which is the 20th to the 22nd of April. We'll be going to both of those, so you'll be able to see all of the stuff that we get from there. So let's start with uh, this guy. 
This is uh, multitracks.com. Yeah, this is a Will chat Doggett, for Will Doggett. Certified trainer and director of training development at multitracks.com. I'm here at Worship Connect at Sweetwater in Fort Wayne, Indiana in the Performance Theater. You guys are going to get a very kind of special behind the scenes uh, video tutorial. Uh, so this, uh, this event, we've had Matt Gilder and the rest of the band for Chris Tomlin here. Matt has this great Ableton rig where he's running two computers at the same time, what we call a redundant rig, to where if one goes down, the other one keeps going. So what I wanted to do is kind of break down everything you need to do this. Now, if you look at the table, uh, it's a bit of a mess here. So obviously, you don't want to stand on stage leading worship with this. <laughs> Typically, you're going to put that in a rack like what Matt has. It's going to be nice and neat and tidy. But I try to break everything out so that you can get kind of each uh, individual piece and understand it. So the very first thing is kind of why would you... Right, I won't play the whole thing, but this is quite interesting because... Um I don't know if any of you have been, well, I know you both have been uh, uh, involved in live production. Running an A and a B rig, uh, uh, you know, similar, if you're doing a live show and you've got maybe uh, virtual instruments, you've got backing tracks, you've got DAW stuff happening, it doesn't have to be uh, Ableton Live, it could be Logic or whatever. There used to be these kind of really custom bespoke kind of relay switched kind of sensing systems that became really kind of complicated and insanely expensive to be able to run two rigs. We're sort of talking, you know, Beyonce, that kind of thing, where you might have two things going and then you've just got a redundant system. So if one goes down on one, you flip it in, same as you might. And, and this is sort of, in many ways, has been the the kind of uh, the domain of like super superstars, whereas actually, you know, a lot of people depend on this for shows. And this was a really interesting and quite creative way of setting up an A and a B system. I'll, I'll run through it very quickly just because. Uh, so if you've got two computers, they're running together. What he's using is the eye connectivity. I think it's the Mepo, which is a four channel MIDI with two USBs in. The controller is going into that, so the USB is going to each computer. So each computer has the same MIDI feed. So when you press start and start using remote commands, they're all happening at the same time. Then uh, I think what was the next thing that we were using? He was using there. He's using this uh, radial. This was kind of cool. This is the radial SW8, uh, which is oh, it's rolled out. Which is basically a sixteen, uh, an eight input DI box with two sets of eights and eight outputs, and you can flip between A and B on a foot switch so you've basically got if you've got eight outputs from each audio system you can basically choose which audio system is being routed to the eight di outputs that's kind of nifty uh, also using um a midi solutions r8 which is a kind of midi event to foot switch type relay thing so you can use it for foot foot switching between the radial r8 then he's also got a midi solutions programmable input selector which just basically takes an input and routes it through to a specific output on a foot switch which so you join all of this stuff up and then it allows you to basically have two complete systems that you could on a single midi command you can flip between them and they should reign completely as it's a very it's it might sound dull but i thought it was a pretty creative way of doing it. i'm mark i mean i know you did a lot of work with duran which i don't know how much stuff they were playing back live did you have redundancy in your system yes had duplicates of everything so when I did it with Atari Stacys, <laughs> yes, I'm very old. <laughs> oh, my Lord. We had two Atari Stacys, so if one of them crashed, you could just flip to the other one. Um, I can't remember how I flipped between the audio. I think we we were doing ADATs as well at one point, and I think the way I the way I got around the fact if one machine jammed up, I could flip to the other was by, by running one of them through the... Uh, inputs of the other one. Ah, uh, so you go into record, uh, and then but then I ran the whole thing off one of those big simty remote things. So the remote was the common factor. The two ADATs were following the code. If one of them snarled up, you could just you just flip it in and out of uh, record ready. Oh, that's an record ready. Idea. Yeah, exactly. So oh. that was one solution. Then we had some Fostex hard disk recorders. Um, which were brilliant and never went wrong. So there was never really any reason to have an A and a B rig, I suppose. And then it all ended up on uh, laptops. Um, and you just have two laptops running and you start the song at the same time on two laptops and... Um, and hope for the best. <laughs> yeah, and uh, but again, that's... Sneak I don't know, that it's much more reliable than it used to be. Yeah, that's true. My theory is if it runs off batteries, if the power goes out, then, uh, you know it's not going to fail. It will keep going, won't it? As long as your audio interface can run off bus power, then you're, you're, you're fairly yes. kind of cool. That's a or good point a about big, batteries. But we had a big UPS as well, so if anything, so it meant that my power was clean. Wow. Um, and if the power went out, mine didn't. 
I can imagine, especially on samplers. Yeah, no, I can imagine that. Work. I mean, obviously, carting a UPS around the place because they're heavy. They're well, big. they don't need to be that big. You can run it off a small UPS, and you can still get five to ten minutes off a small UPS. And hopefully, they've corrected the problem by then. And if they haven't, then game over. Everybody anyway. else has stopped playing anyway, and it, and you've got time to rethink. You know, so. Oh, wow. I like that idea about uh, record ready and flipping the inputs and chaining them together. That's a neat idea. I mean, this kind of strikes me as because this whole system, this was, I say, Will Doggett from uh, Live Tracks, uh, I think it was called, uh, I'm just, I don't know, Live Redundant Ridge, uh, um, that uh, multitracks.com was just this kind of lateral thinking and a way to solve the problem. It's still not cheap. I mean, I think the, uh, the, the, the radial was about. 1500 quid that you know it's still a couple of grand but if the show must go on it could well be three guys i don't know if you've had similar experiences because most of the time when we're playing live it's shoestring stuff and you're not going to take much redundancy (laughs) because you've got to travel light as well right yeah i mean uh if some have your old the older viewers remember the uh opera that i did in Uh, 2012 papaya yeah we did a video didn't we um it was great the, the the opera the rig rundown of an of a rock opera or something like that it was called um but that goes into the redundancy system that we had going on for that show which was this was a big big bucks you know very expensive show but um that had uh there was two keyboard players and there was an enormous amount of patch switching across the whole uh across the whole thing so we had essentially another duplicate of both systems no we didn't sorry we had one mac pro but the Mac Pro was capable of running both rigs simultaneously. Uh, gosh, there was a lot of Motu uh, in audio interfaces. But I was just thinking then, is that AVB? If they were all AVB'd into one interface, that wasn't around then, I don't think. But no, that but would work. I suppose it would, would, but then you've still got the single point of failure is the network switch then, isn't it? <laughs> and then, then that can take right, it all okay. out. So it's about redundancy it's... and having not having single points of failure, I suppose. Yeah. I, yeah. I've got a question then. Yeah. Because I did thousands and thousands of shows. So in thousands of shows, I probably had it fail less than a handful of times. So in all the shows you've done, how many times has it really gone that wrong that you needed to switch to a B-rig? Yeah, well, there is that too. I mean, I know that uh, one of the big issues, certainly in recent times before SSDs were prevalent, was the uh, if you're running, and I know Robbie Bronneman ran into this a number of times, didn't he, where there's so much bass flying around on stage, what happens is the the hard drive vibrates and the heads just automatically park because it feels like it's being dropped and they have auto-sensing to kind of make sure that yeah. if you drop it or knock it, it doesn't scratch the surface. So that what would happen if you're you playing You can turn that the, off. Right, oh, okay. You, it, on a MacBook Pro, do you mean? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. You you have to there's a there's a command. You have to type something in the terminal, and you can switch it off. Ah. But yes, that is a problem. So I mean, but it's I guess a solvable that, one. Yeah. Or just have no base in the system. I suppose that's the other thing. You know, have all the but anyway. That that was that's quite common. I think for DJs as well, because they now quite often if laptop DJs. Uh, they'll put. I, I remember seeing people with rigs on massive pieces of spongy foam, so there's very little kind of transference of the actual vibrations uh, going through. But that's. I, don't know, I just thought it was an interesting uh, lateral way of thinking. So essentially, just to just to recap, what he's got is he's got two separate laptop rigs, a common eye connectivity MIDI interface which talks to both of them. Everything is remotely run via, you know, a control surface or a keyboard. So stop commands, you know, clip changes, all of that sort of thing are done by MIDI remote. And then each of the laptops has its own audio interface and they're going into this switching uh, DI box. So you can switch between the two sets of inputs. And then at the same time, there's uh, which is done on a foot switch. And there's also a MIDI input uh, routing because you want to be able to route the MIDI sort of in or out to just one or other rigs, otherwise you'll end up with doubling. And that was, a, a, these are MIDI solutions-ish uh, things, which also is on a foot switch. So you've got like a, a MIDI command to foot switch emulator, which will then, you know, flip inputs and, and what have you. And that seemed like quite a cool system. And then you can flip back, because if it's, if it's in sync, I mean, if you were running some kind of master clock and that was going into the master interface and running both things, then you could come, when you come back online, they should all pick up again, depending on which DAW you're using. So just kind of quite a laterally interesting way of doing things. Anyway, I thought... The I'd, master... Sorry. The master clock part of it is an important part of it. Because if you've got a stable master clock and it keeps going, obviously... 
as you say, your sequencer will be in the right place, even if it's um, even if it's crashed or whatever. Or you've had to switch. So I'm. Um, I mean, I know that it's a redundant piece of technology, but that uh, the BRC thing was a really brilliant master clock. Oh yeah, that's true. I suppose that does bring in other issues, which is you know because obviously you know it's not just me. It's like Gaz. I mean, how many bases do you take? Do you bother? Do you sometimes think, oh, I'll just take one base and it'll be all right, and don't have one at the side of the stage you could just grab if you snap a string because that can be a game killer, can't it? Really? I, um, yeah. I, I mean, I take two out with me uh, for the big gigs, and uh, you know, we, we were you know big gig headlining Simple Things Festival uh, in Bristol, and. Um, <laughs> my first note. I got to do a big note. Bang! String snap. First, first note. Oh dear. <laughs> yeah. So having a, another bass is yeah, it's essential for those shows. Um, smaller gigs, not such a problem. Um, I don't break strings very often. I was so surprised to, so, for the string to snap on that first note. But um, yeah. Uh, but. You know, this topic does tap into one of my pet hates, and that is playback tracks and the evil, evil, evil that no! they have done to mu <laughs> to the music. Evil, I'm telling you. I I tell you, it killed it. It's the death, and I really hate it. I hate it. I think if you're doing electronic music, there's other means, but I think you know, and I think there's in some situations it's possible, but in most cases it's evil. So yes, name and shame. Interesting. That's what I, say. I don't know. I mean, because sometimes I mean the thing is, is you know, okay, put it. Let me put it to you this way: if you've got a touring act, you've got you know some small gigs, and the public want to see them, they can't afford to take enough musicians on the roads to be able to make. Boo! It so I mean that that happens though, doesn't it? I mean it does happen. Yeah, but this is why this is why I keep music live. You know, it's just like it's 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 terrible. <laughs> I wouldn't it. have had a bloody Ooh. job if 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 Duran didn't have backing tracks. I'd I'd have never worked for them. Well, and I should add, <laughs> the public are become more and more sort of demanding yeah. as to what they want to hear reproduced in a live scenario as well. I I asked some girls who just seen this concert that I knew was there was playback tracks, and I I told them, and they couldn't give a monkey's. You know, they loved it. They were singing along. Yeah. They said makes no difference. So I was thinking, am I just stuck in some sort of muso thing here? But no, I realised it's spiritually dead and it's <laughs> cheating. Music is the moment. Bang! Yeah, well, I suppose, I mean, one could argue, because, you know, there could be arguments where is, is Ableton Live playback or not? Yes, it is, but it can be configured in a way that makes it much more of the moment, that right? Makes That makes all the difference. I think what I'm talking about is safety net back, you know, you know, this is the kind of thing. If the lead vocalist, he struggles on the chorus to hit those high, so he's singing live in the verses when it gets to the chorus. Automate out his lead vocal, playback goes in with the lead vocal, you know, back into the verse, live. Everyone thinks, oh, he's singing live. Okay. It's the deception. It's the deception uh, okay. is what I'm, I'm with you on that. That. Is, right. that is what I'm in. That's what I'm raging I, against, you see. It's if the I deception. go to see a band, I, <laughs> well, I want to hear the see, vocalist sing. I don't want it to be on backing sure. tracks. For sure. But also, also, the thing that most of them do is just augment the backing vocals. Now, get getting backing vocals live is hard. For real, it's very is hard. really hard. So they just have everyone's kind of miming. The backing vocals come off the playback tracks. I tell you, that's what I'm going after. That's the stuff. <laughs> Name and shame that stuff. Hang on. Definitely. When we, when we collectively did that show in Bristol, I had all my backing tracks and I had all my backing vocals on there. Was so, I rubbish? So, Gaz, <laughs> does that mean Mark should have actually hired a band? Yeah, I, I think... should have done. <laughs> You know I what, if I'd asked in the chat room and said, excuse me, can somebody come and play in my band with me? They probably would have, I probably nah, would have had I, a couple of offers, wouldn't I? We wouldn't have been able to I, do it, though. I think, you you know, there's exceptions. Why? why? Because the stage was too small. Yes. I'm talking about deception. You know, when Millie Vanilli got busted, you know, and it was a big deal oh, sure. and everyone was like, wow. Yeah. 
I'm talking about a, a industry-wide deception that goes on all the time and no one says anything about it. It just keeps, it keeps on going on. Yeah. That's what I'm going on about. You doing your performance and other people doing things and using it, that's, you know, that's okay. And so long as there's creative and performance elements into it, it's a, it's a deception. That's what's wrong. Yeah. I really, if that's I, what's wrong. If I go and stand in the front of house rack of any gig and I look in the rack, I bet you I'll find either Autotune or TC Helicon. So isn't that deception? Uh, if the lead singers so. being no, no, because I, th I think you could just treat that like what what you know a, a distortion pedal makes those notes of the guitar kind of gives them extra sustain you know so no I don't no, it's think not like that, being I, tuned though is it I mean if I'm being I mean I can't sing in tune perfectly in tune I can sing close but I'm not I, you know not pitch perfect <laughs> but if I've got a, a TC Helicon in a rack and I sing I sound bloody awesome. So does that mean I'm now a good singer because I'm being digitally enhanced in some way? That's definitely deception. Because if people heard my uh, raw voice, they'd go a bit at it. Well, can I just can I have a point yeah, in here? On. I think uh, well, there's, there's two things. First thing, Millie Vanilli were actually busted because they didn't sing on the record at all. No, at all. So that's a difference. Yeah, that's, they were just I the front, that. and that's not unusual. You know, we've seen that there's a lot of those old classic yeah. uh, '50s musicals where there was a ghost singer, whatever. But anyway, let's gloss over. The, the other thing that happens is you've got show the talent shows like X Factor and The Voice and this new. Um, thing that uh, um, Gary Barlow's doing is when you you know there are parts where the singers have to audition and they sing and then they have this kind of opening number where all the bands come together and do and, and you can tell I'm hearing that and I'm going they are not singing that live that is not happening live that sort of deception no, I, I agree because that makes you think well gosh they're good and they're not you know yeah. or they might not be that good they might well, be good but they might not be good enough to for the for the people to risk having them blow it on live TV so anyway. You can they feel it when it. somebody's blow it on doing TV. it, can't you? I agree. If they're not good enough, they should blow it. Come yeah. on, bust up. I, I tell you what, there's only so few slots I mean, you know of what? music that's available. There's only so few slots. People can only take in so much. There's only so many slots on the playlists, you know. Just boot out the crap. You know, there's so many great musicians, so many great bands out there. Just all the ones who have to cheat. That's what. That's that, That's it. Okay. That's all I I think say. I've just blown my own argument, actually, because I've just said you can feel it when somebody's <laughs> actually doing it for real, and that's what you're on about, isn't it? It's like music is about something that comes from inside of us. It's an emotion that we communicate to other human beings. And if we're using backing tracks or or any of this tuning stuff we're not doing that and then that that well, isn't what music should be about maybe it, depends. it, it, depends. it just becomes a, a kind of a, a pastiche of entertainment okay there. well here's a here's a, 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 i was going to move on but I, I feel i have to come back here with another point right so <laughs> sorry oh you God. make a record right you might adjust the timing the tuning gaz yeah is that okay because that's not yeah. real that's not real either yeah no, because the playback of a listening listening to music in a sort of abstracted situation, you know, that wasn't. It's not there and then, is it? It's a completely different thing. I think going to watch a concert is all about the moment. You know, if you're making a production, I, you know, that's for. Uh, it's under a completely different set of. It's it's you're not. You're not pretending that you're there in the living room, are you? You know, you want to maybe okay, make that. Okay, here's the distinction okay, then. Maybe. The distinction is, are you going to watch a show or a performance? They're different things. Yeah, that's a good point. Anyway. That is a good point. We should probably move on, but um, just what somebody did put make some uh, Bantam eighty in the YouTube chat room made a point is like basically a lot of because of the way that you know people are so famous, you know they want to just have gone to see Justin Bieber or uh, Little Mix or whatever. Who you know I'm not saying they don't perform some of their stuff or all of their stuff live, but in that case it's more about the event of being associated, being able to see their kind of uh, idol in the flesh in some respects. So that's and there's a different motivation as well, and I think that's always been the case for kind of high pop and certain teen pop it's not always about hearing them perform in the way that that you know that that shows whether they're good at a b or c it's about being there and seeing them and having them um, project themselves upon the audience in some respect so it's a different a different dynamic anyway i'm gonna stop there we're gonna have to go in with our uh, <laughs> we're, we're now just gonna have a word from our our, our sponsors uh, so if you don't mind
I, well, I'm assuming we're going to have a word from our sponsors because uh, this is live uh, broadcast, so it may or may not work. Ah, here we are. Isotope, that's right. Isotope Neutron, uh, the mix assistant, which enables you to basically analyse your mix visually and audio in audio spectrum. The mix assistant allows you to sort of visualise and see frequencies that are causing problems that you might not be able to tell exactly what they are by ear. You can visualise them and it helps you essentially sort of clear out the uh, the conflicts, the frequency conflicts in the mix. It also allows you to kind of get a mix started by throwing and saying, oh, this is a bass track, try this, this is a drum track, try this. And it gets you on the kind of the route to mix much more quickly. We did talk uh, about this last week and it was a very interesting process. Obviously, you can add your own flavour and live performance aspects to the mix as well but this is a really fascinating piece of dsp technology you can download a free copy to check it out at isotope.com forward slash neutron automatic instrument detection suggestions of processing and using their kind of their latest dsp technology really does open up the possibilities and give you a, another way of evaluating a mix we do recommend that you check it out and we thank you very much uh, neutral uh, isotope very much for joining us on the, uh, in a sponsorship way and we've got a competition uh last week uh we asked you to tweet the hashtag uh oh what was the hashtag i'm trying to remember i probably should not show that screen that's right uh the hashtag uh the mix factor and uh neutron to at sonic state and I isotope inc and we have a winner from last week a chai call a chap called matthew zapile is mm zapile z-a-p-p-i-l-e he said okay sonic state has sold me i really want to try neutron now well you can if you haven't already you can now own it so you are now the winner so i should say uh, we also got a competition this week and we're looking for a couple of hashtags on twitter first one is best mix ever and the second one is neutron best mix ever is one word and a certain neutron n-e-u-t-r-o-n to at sonic state and at isotope inc so if you tweet those two things and any other phrases or pictures or anything uh, then our uh, special algorithm will pick up all the entries and we'll be able to pick a random winner from all of that lot so once again we thank isotope for their sponsorship of the show right um next next oh yes here we go this is uh, tatsuya leaving korg uh, tatsuya takahashi who is the guy behind a lot of well kind of i like to think i mean the sort of analog revival was kind of led by the korg monotron uh, the monotribe uh, and all the sort of other little nifty effects and then on to the uh, the mini log and the monolog i mean these are kind of pretty a uh, fairly i mean i think they said what is it t 21 instruments in seven years that uh, Tats worked mm. on. I interviewed him at NAM. I've got an interview coming up, which uh, just sort of a little bit of background. But he's off to uh, warmer, well, not warmer climbs. He's off to Cologne uh, to work on more socially, um, social change type audio. We don't know who it is or what it is, but it's kind of the end of an era. I mean, he's mm. pretty, he's, he's like the, the, the poster boy <laughs> for this kind of analog revival, certainly mainstream production yeah. of it, right? Well, yeah, I mean, so what are we doing? We're looking at Monotron, Monotron Duo, Monotron Space, uh, Monotribe, Volca Bass, Volca Keys, Volca Beats, Volca Sample, Volca FM, Volca Kick, uh, Monot uh, Monot um, Monolog, mon mini um, and Mini Log, Mini Mini Log, mo Mini Log, uh, SQ One. Uh, did you uh, have a, an in on the chaos pads as well? I'm not sure. Maybe some sort of KP. Um, Maybe at early stage. I don't MS, know. MS20, MS20, you know, uh, yeah, of course. desktop. You know, it, it, it really has helped bring uh, the analog revival. It's, it's, if anything, has been the... Uh, the 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 tipping point or the thing that has driven that it, it's 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 his contributions and it really is enormous and uh when i heard this news i was i was really disappointed if i'm honest you know because i just he has made so many exciting things happen well, and you uh, must have bought a, 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 you've got i mean you've got a bunch <laughs> of volkers for a start right <laughs> I have got quite a lot of his things. So, I mean, uh, and, uh, you know, he's also, his very kind of cool manner is very inspiring as well. And, uh, you know, and I'm fascinated by him, actually. I'm fascinated that he's had that sort of like London kind of experience that he's managed to sort of combine with his Japanese, well, him being Japanese. But, uh, you know, I think... It's, it's a very unique set of circumstances. One of the things that's mind blowing is like the Korg of all companies having, you know, adopting sort of like a more open source 
approach to things you know labeling the the the, the, the circuit boards with, yeah. with patch points and all sorts of things like this you know just really very different from that very corporate uh, japanese um that we're more used to uh so very influential yeah, incre- figure. very influential figure indeed yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I when i was interviewing and there's one story he told me he said you know when he uh, uh graduated from his engineering degree engineering and design i think it was he basically just flew to japan and knocked on Korg's door and say kind of i want to work for you and basically said i've built this and and kind of you know just barged his way not barged but presented himself and and, and got the job which is a really you know it's, it's kind of like a, a, a one of those sort of fairy tale stories isn't it it's that sort of thing rather than being plucked out of obscurity he's just went for it and and you know his single-mindedness is obviously shown in the product design as well yeah so speculating what 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 is he going to do next I you don't know, know what a t- you know what is he? See, well, there's so, a couple. Of, there's a couple of spin-off topics about that. Actually, I don't. Mark, have you got any of the Korg stuff? Uh, have you you've experienced? I mean, I'm guessing some of these fit right uh, into the pocket of what you sell in your shop as well. These little portable kind of battery. Well, I've had I've had some of it come come and go, so I know what it is. Um, I like the drum machine. There you go. Out of 21 products, I've gone like, oh, I like that one. Um, I know I really like the Volca drum machine because I because we're so 808 909 fixated it's kind of in that same kind of area but it's cleverer um the same with the sense just like it's if you like if you were to take the core ingredients of things and go i just need it to do the things that it does well and only those things he's somehow done that with each of those units and then made it that you can have lots of them. Does that does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Mm-hmm. As a, as a, that collecting, on. and I think what you were saying there, Gaz, about the fact that he kind of he blazed the trail. What I mean by core going, hey, look, we can do it. It kind of made a lot of people maybe sit and go, oh, may, maybe it mm. is possible. Because before then, it was like, mm. no, you can't make real analog stuff affordable. It's impossible. It's impossible. Mm. But you know, you can, and they have, and that sort of opened those floodgates. And I think that's kind of important. Yeah, and also. His influence, you know, you think about Yamaha and the sort of the Reface range, the Roland Boutique range, you know, would those things, would they have been made if it wasn't for what he'd done and the Volkers? I, 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 I doubt it somehow. Possibly not. Be, yeah. Possibly, yeah. So, you know, because it's people really... Have been, it's, people have, oh, sorry, I'm talking all over you, aren't I? Bad man. It's fine. Sorry about that. Fine. No, no, go ahead. And people have been, like, asking Roland to reissue the TB303 since they went over, like, 2,000 quid years ago, haven't they? Yeah. Um, And Roland have just gone, no, we're not going to do that. We want to move on and release the same um, circuitry that we're currently working on in another 50 cents, all exactly the same. Um, Yeah. (laughs) There's, like, there is this element as well, you know, and certainly Volker users know very much this, that there's almost... I don't want to say punk rock, but um, there's something like that about it. Those things, they've, you know, like take the Volker bass, for instance, you know, there's there's wild little twists, you know, they, they're they not just recreations of things. Each one of those brings brand new little twists. And I really like how the Volker series has developed, how they've just added extra little twists, active step, uh, um, jump steps, and uh, what's the, the warp active step on the Volker FM. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, so these kind of little interesting, quirky... Oh, um, no, I totally agree. You know, okay, I here's, think, a, here's, yeah. here's a question Rock for you then. Right. What next? What would you like to see now? I mean, okay, I'll start with you guys. What new Volker would you like to see next? What's your? I mean, let, let's maybe forget about the mixer. I don't know. Maybe. Okay. What, what do you think? Uh, the Volker mixer. <laughs> <laughs> um, it still is that un. You know, it, it, I can't believe how long we've been waiting for that product. You know, from someone. It's still. Uh, it's still. I mean, there are. I might be wrong about this. Please, anyone, show me things if there have been any Volker mixer made by other people. That kind of, you know, what we're talking about there is small format mini jack mixer. It's terrible. It's one of my my bugbears, you know, the mini jack. The mini jack is sort of prevalent on these kind of devices, yet it's so clumsy having to sort of put them into adapters and splits into, you know, just, you know, and the fact that you can have on a small format, many, many, many inputs, you could plug loads. Cause one of the joys of these things is collecting up lots of them and then being able to have them all on and stuff is just a lot of fun. So Volker wise though. Okay. Sorry, Nick. Yeah, I totally no, that's cool. bro- no, broke no, no, your I, I, Well, I think, I think maybe Volker effects would be good. That would be a kind of, of interesting. some sort of Volker effect. Definitely. I think, um, you know, as more bucket brigade more, delays, 
Yeah, Bucky Brigade uh, Delays. Lush, yeah. yeah. yeah but works. I think really what they should do is some something sort with of, a cassette uh, in it. Ooh, something <laughs> with a cassette in it. Now it's that about, would be it, cool. It's about the size I, of a cassette, I, though. I think well, they, micro cassette. Oh, even better. <laughs> <laughs> Go, guys. Um, they, they should do di more digital manipulation uh, units. Something that maybe is just about wildly sort of messing with uh, waveforms because that's such a kind of computery thing. So to actually take it, then take it on, you know, sort of into like a little box, but it's actually, you know, like a well, sampler, that, well, that's more. True. Granular, more granular, being able to, to really play around with. No, uh, that's fair enough. So maybe, that's maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe it's the Volca Mellotron uh, then, get, uh, uh, Mark. <laughs> well, yeah, the Volcatron, that's what it needs to be called, the Volcatron, nice. with like little tapes in it. <laughs> and it, actually, you know, they'd be about the same size as saxophone reeds. And, and you screw them in with a little toolkit, <laughs> put them in there, and loads of little tiny tape heads. Yeah, I can't um, imagine. Yeah, I've got another one as well, on? though. Okay. I was talking to. I was talking to somebody earlier on um, who's quite a young chap and he'd come to play some music to me to ask me what the effects were on the music and I was trying to identify them and one of them I said, well, that sounds like the whole thing's been time-stretched and he said, well, what? how would I do that? Can I plug... And I think he's got a Farfisa organ. So he said, can I plug my Farfisa organ into something to make it make that effect? And I, then I that really got me because I was thinking, is there an effect where you can actually play something into a box, like a pedal or a rack, and then it comes out longer. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm thinking like longer, you know, granular yes. synthesis or yeah. something, but longer, in yes, real short, time. Shorter, no. <laughs> oh, yeah, unless it's not No, real shorter, time. no. But, I mean, if I, you know, say I play a guitar, I'm, I'm playing chords on the guitar. Um, oh, I see what you mean. Is so, there something like, like a well, buffer thing, a there, buffer there underrun like, thing that will just stretch it? Reverb type things that would allow you to kind of freeze, like shimmer, well. yeah, and freeze. I suppose that's sort of similar thing. No, good point. Anyway, um, but a box that did that would be cool. Yes, a little time machine. <laughs> I like the sound of that. So, uh, well, we so you know, good luck to you, Tatsuya, wherever you are and what you're doing, and we'll be uh, very keen to find out. And and of course, you know, you got to bear in mind that you know, generally people are planning products, you know, eighteen months, two years in the future. So he's sticking around as a, a cons consultation and sort of helping out. So I'm guessing, you know, he's probably already got products in the the pr in production that will be coming out later after he's gone. So you know, I don't think it's over by any stretch. I think I just realised what the next Volker should be. It should be a little Volker chemistry set for manufacturing your own sort of uh, party drugs, you know, just to give to or, give out to the audience. Allegedly, you know, yeah, or not, probably. <laughs> I don't think that would be such a good idea uh, on live streams. Anyway, right. Um, <laughs> so what's next? Let's see. Uh, Tans Levy Korg. Uh, maybe. Well, let's have a look at this one. Music can now be produced. This is the new Electron Electron Harmonics Synth Nine pedal. Done. An electronic music well, this isn't. This is some bloke in front of what looks like a 55. Because, of course, you'll want, you'll want to, with your synth pedal, just basically play cheesy 80s poly riffs. Why wouldn't you? This is Bill Rupert. Oh, yeah, baby. Probably. So he goes through all nine of these uh, presets. I did hear, actually, there is a bit in it. I think it might be this one. It might a bit of Your Eyes by Peter Gabriel. Here we go. Which was a surprise. Oh, I can't rewind it properly. Anyway, there's basically a whole bunch of these kind of things and this is the based on synth preset oh, is a combination I'll stop that this is based on the uh their polyphonic pitch algorithm so we, what what have we got we've got the uh i think i've got a web page up here with all of the mm. all of the pedals that are in that series they've got uh what they've got the b9 uh the c9 which are both sort of organ uh, machines uh oh where's the other one there was a, a mel9 did you get a, a key9 I know, what's that a key9 a b uh, it's a, Key nine on. is like the roads on, and the Mel nine piano. is a Mellotron type thing. Mellotron, yeah. It's, this is interesting because they they started out with the microsynth many 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 many, which people you know still rate and still use. Oh, that's brilliant. And yeah, you've got have you got any of these things? Mm, yeah, absolutely. And I, I've got the Mel nine. Um, 
and uh, I've played with the others. Uh, not this one, this new one. Um, but it's interesting because essentially it's the same product, just with a, different sounds. What I, yeah, and and I strongly suspect my my feeling how it works is that they've got this terrific polyphonic pitch uh, um, algorithm that first appeared in the Pog. Um, I think that was the first time we've seen it, and then they've used it or, and developed it into lots of different products over the over the years, like the Hog, then which was uh, like the Pog, but we but then we've seen it, it in multitude of multitude of things now, in, including all of these pedals, which they've all got the same form factor. They've all got nine sounds and i strongly suspect that those that that it's based on convolutions uh that it's got some com some sort of impulses of those actual sounds because like the the mellotron one is is profound in that you play it there's no real l lag it's very 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 responsive and it sounds uh, uncannily realistic it doesn't behave anything like a mellotron you'd have to sort of simulate that in the way that you play um, and and just a quick mention about bill rupert who does that and does many of the electro harmonics uh, demos as a guitarist he is incredible he's one of the best i've seen at being able to mimic actual keyboard playing on a guitar he really is very good at that so he's an ideal demonstrator for this stuff but it's interesting because when you just play regular stuff say on the Mel 9 for instance it's a peculiar mishmash of sound going on so you do have to you do have to kind of approach it in a certain way it's very responsive but that curious mishmash is also something that I'm quite interested in them in using them in ways perhaps I don't know you know in, in unusual ways doing doing lots of pitch bending is really interesting with them uh, very very cool and I don't know about this this is just my my hunch but i think that the great and wonderful david cockerell is somewhere behind the scenes on uh, these he's pedals. the guy from ems akai i mean and we were talking about this yesterday weren't we guys i mean that uh, uh, i don't know mark do you are there and can you think of anything else that has got a polyphonic pitch and analysis algorithm i can't i, I mean we thought the tc um, maybe the tc an stuff app for oh well, there's an apple osx app that's got a polyphonic algorithm in it uh, one of the boss pedals has got it. Is it the GR, the new, uh, the newest GR? GR yeah, blue coloured thing. Right. Yeah. So there's a the couple SY, of them. The SY three. The SY. Yeah. The SY three. Is it SY three hundred three or three hundred or something? Yeah, I think something like that. So there are a couple of things, but I, all of the ones I've tried don't work very well. This one I haven't tried. I love the number nine, <laughs> but I don't like any of the sounds in it. It was this very kind cheesy. Of demo, wasn't it? Yeah. So cheesy for me it's i don't i mean that's probably mm -hmm. borderline rude but i like really like i want it to be gnarly and dirty and resonant and filters to be sweeping about all over the place and to me like synth means you know like their micro synth of yesteryear you can grab hold of it and change all the sounds and you can program it to do what you want it to do so nine presets to me just would be i don't know i'd just I think you They're get not a couple, the nine I'd choose for you, a start. You get a couple of um, of, uh, of of like uh, parameter uh, adjustments for each algorithm. I think so. You yes, get, you do get that. But, right. but and, yeah, and, it's yeah, and those are, and those are just and, and they're different on depending which algorithm or, you know that you're using. Um, but it's kind of it's philosophy is like a stomp box. You know, it isn't. It's all about a complete lack of complexity it really works as if like a chorus pedal or something like and in fact that was one way i was thinking about the mel 9 you know if you just considered it because you've got like a wet dry blend if you take the wet dry blend down so really towards the dry end you know you can get it to sound like sort of chorus type effects you know so that there is a tendency with these things to sort of you know show off with them and make them very novelty but once you start bedding them back or or integrating them with your other effects that's when some of the the deeper the deeper sort of powers of it ha happen mm. um that's yeah and that's certainly my experience i guess if you put a, a volume pedal between uh it and your amp rather than your guitar in it then you could end up with some nice sort of more uh envelope based stuff which would be outside of your normal kind of transient and an attack from a guitar so you mm. get those sort of sounds out of it but uh, uh, ultimately ultimately they win for me because they're playable they're very very playable what's so, the, what's uh, okay so the questions have been coming up in the chat what is the delay like i mean obviously at the very low notes it's going to be slower because mm -hmm. of the cycle but what's it 
it's it's very playable. I mean, I, I on my pedal board, I've um, I've got uh, the the pitchfork, so that's just a uh, a pitch shifter, but polyphonic pitch shifter. So I assume it is, and and, and then I had the Mel Nine next to it, and they felt the response of them felt very similar. Okay, it, there is a degree of latency, but it's a playable degree of latency. I think that's right, that's, uh, that, that's but the it's key. interesting. I was just trying to think. Um, TC Electronics stuff, uh, the the Helicon stuff, where you can play your guitar in and the, and it'll harmonise to the guitar against the vocal. That mm. that's polyphonic, and they've got their tuner. Yeah, that's I also polyphonic, I, but it's is no, it, it only the TC stuff only identifies the interval of a, ma a major and a minor. Okay. So no, no more no more than that. So I mean, yes, it does do it, but. Um, that's... Interesting, but so you. I mean, I think you're right. I mean, it, they've basically got this algorithm, which doesn't seem like anybody's got mm. operating as successfully, and they're just kind of you know. Yeah, because I mean, it. I've got the Eventide H9, which is you know got, uh, and I got the Max one, so I've got, it's got all the pitch algorithms, and it's got many of the great Eventide algorithms, but they don't appear to have a polyphonic pitch shifter yeah. well they certainly don't within the h9 so interesting and there's a lot of grunt in those things so you'd be surprised i don't know mark have, have you got any I mean, octaviders and what have you i mean i suppose there's that but this yeah polyphony helps. they're all analog though that's a frequency divider isn't it an ah, octavider okay. generally yeah. unless all the whammy things are proper pitch shifter but um yeah, I don't know. The, the I mean, new... I want to know if you put different sounds in the front end of it, is it responsive to that, or does it just patch track the pitch and well, only the pitch? In We've, other words, does the tonality of the guitar make a difference to what comes out the other end of it? Ah, okay. We've been using it with an ele with an, a viola with a with a bug mic on it, um, and using it to sort of kind of thicken out the sound of that. Um, which you see, that's the way to do it, not playbacks. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Um, but, you know, uh, <laughs> when you add when you add that when you add it to the viola. See, I'm having to mimic a viola here for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about. It's this like resonant it's wooden a big box. Violin. <laughs> um, it sounds amazing, actually. It sounds amazing. Again, it's about getting the blend right, um, but just the way it just. Had, what I noticed that it did for the viol for the viola, when you play a violin or viola with a electric instruments, it's almost like it's got it's, it's got like a peak. It's like a very sort of peaky sound, mm. and that peaky sound isn't fat enough for rock. Rock instruments are kind of quite fat sounding, and what the mm. Mel Nine does to the viola is it just kind of gives it a wider foot sonic footprint in a way that just makes it sort of work with rock instruments you know it's less less peaky and more sort of mm. yeah interesting really cool. okay um let's move on uh, obviously there's some sad news this week uh which well not the, it, it, towards the beginning of the week let's just uh, but but check this out it's amazing <laughs> Mr. Clyde Stubblefield at what looks like a drum clinic, doing a bit of his funky stuff. Sadly, passed away on 18th of February, and it's a it, it, it's sad in many ways. I mean, I don't know if, how active he was during later life, but yeah, round of applause there for Mr. Absolutely. Sad news that he's passed away. I don't know how active he was in later life, but it was it got me thinking. I mean, you know, there's so many things to this. I mean, first of all, how many tracks has the funky drummer or any of his grooves been sampled on? I mean, it, it's it, you could argue it's the birth of hip hop. You know, he used to play with James Brown, obviously, from 1965 uh, on a lot of classic uh, recordings. And his groove is sort of enabled a ton of hip hop stuff essentially i mean it wasn't just him obviously but he's one of the most iconic break kind of guys you know there's the armen break and there's the funky drummer funky drummer did get killed to death but he he's got a load of other breaks that were just as valid and just as heavily used and it's 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 a sad day but it's also brilliant that he was around and did what he did but what a groovy drummer eh? i mean mark did, you know we we grew up you know our musical journey was kind of through the heyday of people using a lot of his beats in early kind of sampled up and hip-hop and you know cut up stuff right yeah i mean the thing i liked about it was that his drum kit sounded like a drum kit 
So actually, if you if you look at my my musical career, if my musical career started when I was like say fourteen or fifteen when I started playing the guitar, Phil Collins had come along with his like canonic kind of um, tom toms, and everything at the end of that era was kind of this <laughs> big kind of reverb on things. And then when that came back around, I suppose because I guess he was the whole James Brown thing predates that anyway, uh, when it became popularised and sampled, to me it was like refreshing because it sounded like, oh, hang on a minute, that actually sounds like a drum kit now and not like uh, this kind of synthetic, overly gate-reverbed kind of thing. So, um, I mean, it led me to miking kits up with like one mic and trying to get that sound. Yeah. Uh, Unfortunately, I never met anybody that could play as well as him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is that. Because when he plays it, you just say, oh, that looks really easy. That's how it's yeah. done. And then you just go, wait a minute. Uh, that interplay between the hi-hat and the grace notes on the snare, I mean, just astonishing, really. I mean, it really kind of, it was such an iconic thing. And I mean, this also got me thinking a little bit more about, you know, there used to be a period, and I don't want to get all retro and think, oh, not like the old days, but I was trying to think, okay, drummers that I would know the name of now, the last person I can think of that, that you would think, oh, yeah, that guy's a drummer and he's a drummer drummer was Dave Grohl. That's the last person I can think of that you think, yeah, he's a he's a famous drummer, That's that a new famous drummer, not like a, a kind of Clyde Stubblefield age uh, famous drummer. And I was thinking, I, I honestly can't think of anybody. I mean, there must be. Maybe I'm out of the loop, which is entirely possible and very likely. But it seems like there's not, there aren't those kind of big musical personalities around so much. And and that's that's that just, I thought that was an interesting topic of debate. Click. Click track. Click. Yeah, click track killed, killed the great musician, really. It, the click track. Oh, God, you know, the, dominance, <laughs> the dominance of the click track. No, nah, I'm, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. You can look at it. Look, look, look at the, the equivalent of the fossil record, the vinyl record. Yeah. You look at you look at what happens. You look at when, when once production techniques came, once the click track became the dominant force, that's when that's when we kind of lost track of great musicianship. It truly is. It truly is. Um yeah, possibly. I, I'm just trying to think. But, well, no, I'm, I'm not. Because, just... okay, let me let me justify it. Let me justify it a little bit. What happens when you play with a great drummer, like a really great drummer, you know, the sense of dynamics isn't just volume yeah. up and down. It's a front-to-back dynamic as well, being able just yeah. to subtly bring things forward, bring in things backwards. And it's a beautiful thing. And we can, and you can just, you know, and a really great musician can, can, can control that, you know, like sort of, um, you know, it, they, they can... It's a beautiful thing. It's not a bad thing. Once everything got so rigid, I mean, look, we've got like 30 years of rigid, rigid, rigid music, you know, rigid. Drum you later. Drummers, drummers really, really struggled in that environment. I, I remember a, a, an example, particularly, I was sitting in a control room and the drummer was in the room not hearing what the producer was saying and the producer and the engineer and well, a couple of people who were producing the session, you know, involved in the session, um, and this drummer I loved playing with because it's a beautiful, soulful drummer to play with. And anyway, he was trying to play. They were trying to force him to the click. And they were just slagging him off. They were slagging off his musicianship. They were slagging him off. They were saying he was rubbish, you know. And, and I heard them slagging him off to other people as well. And I just thought, that, so there we go. That's that, that example there, I think, manifest across 30 years of click dominance has seen... Mm. That's why I think it, so. it gives drummers an inferiority complex. That well, whole maybe, play to yeah, the click, yeah, maybe so. I mean, I've sat with people and and then uh, recorded them. They've done like a great performance, and then we've gridded it. <laughs> so you go through a sixteenth note at a time in Pro Tools on the multi track across and just juggle things back and back and forth. In fact, Rich Hilton taught me how to do that. Thinking about it, but um. Oh, I don't know. And then you chop it up into chunks and then you go, actually, that verse is better than that verse. Right. OK, let's use that verse then. Oh, right. That chorus. Oh, no, those first two bars of that chorus are the best one. And in the end, there's like about three or four bars of their playing and it's been uh, homogenized and dehumanized. Um, and, all, you know, all of the push pull stuff's gone out of it. Um, and it's kind of like we've turned them into a loop, I suppose, as as a programmer pro tools guy 
I'm yeah, guilty of this. And, yeah, well, I, I always, I mean, I would like to say, I mean, I always felt really uncomfortable with uh, cutting up uh, drum multi tracks because I just thought, well, I can't. I mean, I, I program drums a bit. I mean, I'm not a drummer. I'm not a musician. It's like, what, what's good? Um, have I, have, am, am I the best person to decide this? It sort of felt, I felt the responsibility was a bit too beyond my musical capability in many ways. And so, you know, I think, but, but as a counter to that, you know, the, the thing is that that's changed massively. I mean, now you can take the most the, the grooviest musician in the multi-track and f and impose their feel onto it this is if you're not playing all together in the same room and you're doing overdubs i mean gaz you were talking about that as well where you can just kind of go that's a really groovy performance make the grid work to him so you know just get the tempo map and it just let yeah. it work and, and then snap to that so you're still snapping yeah. but you're not snapping to a yeah. rigid grid yeah yeah I think that's the that's the key. That's the key. And um, you know, I don't want to be a hypocrite about things and but you know, I think preserving musical performance if it's, you know, it's only worth doing if it's a good performance, you know what I mean? But um yes, if you use some of the tools like Melodyne 4, I often go on about the the um pit, uh, the, the timing detector within Melodyne 4, the ability to uh, create astonishing click tracks from non-click performances is amazing and what and what i do is i use melodyne 4 as a means to to create a, a tempo map then of the recording and then i'll export that out i tend to use it in cubase then um cubase has a pretty good uh tempo detection it's no very good tempo detection algorithm but it, it the cubase one works on a on a single track so you can kind of feed it um hi-hats or overheads or something like that um not or, or anything guitar but but with the melodyne way it uh aggregates from as many tracks as you put into it so um it's so you get much more a, yeah okay interesting yeah and it's cool because uh you know if you've got like a whole band's worth of multi-track and you've put them in i what i don't well i tend to sort of pick like maybe three or four drum tracks a rhythm track uh, and a bass track whatever um and then you do this tempo sign. I think the thing is, though, it is hard work. It is hard work to do this. And, yeah. you know, a lot. And, and I think this is the bottom line. A lot of producers, just because it's hard work, will just seek out, as Mark mentioned, you know, just a small part of it, copy and paste it well, or that, whatever. I mean, I, I, but that, because it's, yeah, that, again, comes down to the fact that, you know, when all of this stuff was in its infancy, you know, the Pro Tools operator and the recording process would have been in the studio the thousand dollars you know plus a day studio and you're doing that in that environment now you mm. don't necessarily you know you wouldn't work in that way you'd probably go and record some drum tracks or some wild tracks come yeah. back sit in your yeah. your basement studio or whatever sort it all out maybe go then go back again and do some overdubs or whatever so you you, you can mm -hmm. you can compartmentalize it a lot more so yeah. that's that's why it's probably coming back in it's not just about it's not about the money on the day it's about the workflow which works to be able to get the best out of it and people are as we saw with the ableton live you know here's how you do the redundancy people are thinking of really interesting and cool ways to use the technology to work with humans rather than to have to humans work with it right mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah yeah you've also you know I, I, there is something going on though with younger people now through largely through like the band wolfpack and we've talked about them before on the show and they did that um all the drum pattern things oh i can't remember what it was uh i'm sure someone in the chat room can help out there the the wolf peck drum oh gosh i'll come back that'll come back to me in a moment but they as a young band have been really keen to sort of help educate um and recently they've been doing a perform uh, performances and having um bernard purdy guest with them Ooh. um and you know <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> yes yeah, so it's some great footage of them you know this young band doing sort of kind of cool stuff with but featuring these these old musicians and, and i love that um the this um it, you know this acknowledgement like what got us with this conversation with with you know the poor clyde stubblefield but just keeping those personalities kind of um yeah. a lot you know alive. I, I think or, that's a really valid point and and uh, as i said you know I, I did sort of like the challenge okay who's who are these? You know, people are throwing lots of ideas, you know, lots of names of other drummers or musicians, and and they're all from sort of most of them are from before that time. So, 
I think that's a, a, an interesting concept. Isn't it? I mean, you know, we've got uh, Corey Henry, you know, we've got some in the keyboard range, you know, some of those kind of people, and they're a guitarist, current guitarist who are virtuoso. But it's very, you know, and, and the same used to be with bass players as well. You get a bit of that, but I mean, I'm thinking... You know, apart from you guys, obviously there are there are aren't so many <laughs> modern recognised virtuo not virtuoso but wealth respected and public name kind of people who are known to a lot of people as great players who have come through. And, and I don't think it's because they're no good. It's because it's harder to find out who they are, perhaps. Right? Who is the um who? Were you talking to Gaz? And I've just Either. done it again. No, no, carry on. No, carry on. It was I was going to say, who is the modern day equivalent of somebody like Steve Gadd? Like, who have we got in 2017 who is the equivalent to Steve Gadd? Because that, he's a sort of a household name, isn't he? Uh, yeah, well, actually, uh, who's, the, who's the guy who played with uh, Jed, uh, Jed, who played with uh, Peter Gabriel? Jed, uh, I can't remember. His oh, name. Jed Lynch. Jed Lynch. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, it's, he's yeah. a really, really good drummer, and he's quite a field yeah, drummer. Really and he's yeah. he's very he's not really into click tracks. I know that, but he when you hear him play, he's really, really good. And he plays with you know the the, the ch and I guess Omar Hakim. But he's a more modern, that's a slightly newer name, but it's still a quite. Jed is yeah, Jed is amazing and and a, and a great friend of mine. But he is uh, we did uh, this one time. Sorry, it's a little anecdote. This one time we were doing this gig. It was an outdoor gig, and uh, it was in a in a town square so people could kind of, when we were doing the sound check people were amassing just kind of interested and uh you know knowing that it was peter gabriel's drummer um you know he's quite a, a lot of people oh you know and he's sound checking the drums he's doing the toms he's going through the whole drum sound checking it and then the guy asks him to play the whole kit and there's a load of people all gathered <laughs> so he goes to play the whole kit <laughs> <laughs> and plays really rubbishly but sort of uh, not rubbish enough to be like obviously rubbish <laughs> no, just, but rubbish enough just for everyone just to disappoint everyone in between <laughs> he's a bit he's, he's quite was he's this quite, deliberate he's a, quite the oh, yeah yeah deliberate deliberately sort of uh you know just knowing all these people kind of expected him to do so well I, remember, I'm sure I did some <laughs> sessions with him because uh on an album I was working on uh this was again it was like there were some classic records that the, pe the people I was working for wanted to kind of recreate some of those drum sounds and drum vibes of that particular time so Jed came in and he brought a load of different bass drums and a load of different mics and you know two, you know different snares and stuff and we went through you know ab it was just tons easy top ab, loads of grooves and we went through them all and he recorded, you know, 15 minutes of each one, a bunch of fills and what have you. And then, you know, I took all the multi-tracks away. And honestly, I was getting so close. I mean, it's not, it's not my skill. I was getting so close to the original sound of the, and feel of the drums that he just kind of like emulated those loops. It was, it was amazing. I was like, wow, how, the, how on earth, how on earth did you do that? You know, and that sort of shows the skill, I suppose, involved with somebody who has that kind of craft. But it's not a kind of like check my drum solo out kind of skill, I suppose. So maybe that's the difference. The flamboyancy is not so much there. There's a guy in London, I can't remember his name, who's got a recording studio in... Uh, up, sort of up north Kentish townish kind of area called Funny Bunny, I think. I think his name's Jeremy something or another, but he's got like loads of vintage equipment in there, old EMI desks and old Telefunken kind of compressors. And if you play him a track, he'll identify what it was that they used on it and set you up with the right kind of kit and the right kind of sounds. And oh, that's wow. similar kind of thing, actually. He's very good. That's an interesting concept. If he's idea. still around. I don't know if he's still around. but Interesting concept. Interesting concept. Uh, right, well, I think, suspect we've kind of waffled on about these uh, the, the subject for a little while. But, yeah, suffice to say, you know, condolences to anybody who's worked with or, or you know, his family. Uh, I, uh, he died at 73, which I was really surprised. I thought he'd be much, much older than that for some reason because I just, you know, thinking James Brown back in the day. But it's it's not as far back as you think, really. That's how quickly these things move. Um, he was, uh, but, you know, sadly missed and a great, a great kind of ambassador and, and kind of iconic figure in the industry. So, you know, this one's for you, Clyde, the spirit of Clyde. Okay. Um, um, 
that's probably it for today. I think essentially now uh, all it remains for me to say is uh, don't forget if you want to uh, enter the competition from Isotope to win Isotope's Neutron, the uh, mix assistant and uh, mix plugin, uh, tweet the hashtag best mix ever and the hashtag Neutron to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. And that will get you entered for the competition. We can uh, send that out next week uh, when we do another show because there will be another one next week. So it just remains for me to say thank you very much, Mark Tinley, for joining us. I've sewn us Megan or Magus? Is it Magus or Magus? Either. Ah, okay. I don't mind. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it. I'll tell you what, if somebody knows how to pronounce it, would they please send me like a voice clip <laughs> of how it should be pronounced should in be proper so. Latin, you know, then when I'm, uh, when I'm wizarding with my noises um, <laughs> and telling people rakelales, that's my, my latest line. <laughs> Um, I've got a, a, a ukulele in my shop, which I claim to have done Reiki on. That might be a lie. <laughs> uh, it's called Jenny, and it's been like treated with special kind of Reiki powers to make the person that buys it into a much better player. But I live in Glastonbury, so all these, uh, all of these things are partially tongue in, tongue in cheek, of course. But um, right. Okay, that's yeah, an interesting idea. Out, yeah. And in there, there's doesn't that come down? What's the? Uh, isn't there the old um, the old blues that thing where the, the the guy goes to the crossroads and plays and sells his soul so he can play guitar better? What's that? There's the, well, isn't that, isn't yes. there, isn't there, there's that sort of spirituality is connected in some way. I'm if sure. you come into Abbey Muse where my shop is, there's a it's an old sixties arcade and there's beige tiles on the floor, and as you come into the muse, there's a white. Uh, tile arrow about one set of tiles white that runs the whole length of the muse and it stops outside my door and there's an arrow coming into my shop pretty much and an arrow going into the art gallery opposite so i've decided i am actually uh, on the crossroads and on that muse. ley line <laughs> and i know a man who throws all sorts of uh, strange alcohol incenses around who came and uh, he plays slide guitar actually so he's he claims to be a New orleans -y sort of a practitioner of such things. He's been by, and to, you know, his spirit to uh, look for souls. Excellent. I don't think I don't think I have a soul. That's though, my, so fa my favorite line from Derek and Clive. Hard to sell it. Derek, Derek and Clive. My favorite line is uh, that yes, uh, we British have uh, the Americans have their soul singers and we have our soul singers. Yeah, that's one of my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Gaz. Also, thank you very much to you for joining us. A pleasure as ever. Um, and don't forget, um, we will be able to see Gaz, the fruits of Gaz's uh, uh, Steinberg Cubase Nine labors fairly soon. Thanks for coming. Thanks very much. Yeah, brilliant. Me. Excellent. Um, uh, Robert Johnson was the name of the guitarist, by the way. The, the chat room in, uh, has, has informed me. So thank you very much. Okay, that's it for Robert this week. Robert Johnson. Yeah, apparently The blues so. player from the 20s. Apparently, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Apparently so. Anyway, that's we it for this week. Uh, we'll say thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye now. <laughs>